Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to your highlight of the program, I'm sure, the Parliamentary Internet Panel, brought to you by me, Andrew Cushion, Work Program Director for Internet New Zealand. I want to cut straight to the chase on this thing without too much of a patter. Today's topic for these parliamentary people is... What role does education, the education system, and educators play in supporting New Zealanders gaining the most benefit from the internet? We're aiming for an open discussion here. I'm going to invite each of our panellists here to address you for three minutes. We're going to go straight to the angry tui at three minutes as well, just to keep things sharp. And then we're going to throw open to the floor and a conversation between them, but hopefully mainly the floor, because of how energised you people will be, to try and have as much of an engaging conversation as possible. At the end of the event, we'll also give them two minutes each to close, again, straight to angry too at the end of the two minutes as well. And I've committed to them all that this will be done by five o'clock. So there's our outline. Now, to who our panellists are, and please put your hands up as I read out your names. We have Gareth Hughes from the Green Party. Thank you, Gareth. We have Claire Curran from the Labour Party. We have Brett Hudson from the National Party. Any moment now, with any luck, as he buys just a little bit more time, we'll have Rhea Bond from New Zealand First. Door shutting. She'll be here soon. And joining them, we've got two educational experts as well. In order to add their perspectives to these things, I'd like to introduce Karen Malush Spencer from Core Ed. Yeah. And Nigel Robertson from the University of Waikato. Yeah. They're our panellists. Let's get into our three minutes. So our first three minutes. Brett, I'd like to ask you to lead us out, please. Thank you, Andrew. I'll uh, start a timer as well. First, let me acknowledge Internet New Zealand, particularly Jordan, your CEO, and, and all of the team who are putting on NetHui. This is, in fact, my first NetHui. It's an enormously impressive uh, experience to join, I have to say. Uh, it was good on the flight up this morning to see a few familiar faces, but I think most people here won't know who I am. Some would say that's because of a very solid campaign I ran in the electorate of Oharu where my job, of course, was uh, to come a good and respectable third behind Peter Dunn, uh, which I did. Uh, now, the point I want to make about education, which is, uh, so ultimately, this is going to be derived from our learners and our teachers, uh, who will define how education and teaching shifts uh, to yield the most uh, uh, benefits from digital technology. But I'll come to that point. First, I'd like, just like to mention a couple of things, obviously, around the enablement uh, this, this government has been investing in. So, uh, through the ultra-fast broadband project and the Rural Broadband Initiative, uh, basically, we are enabling schools to connect, uh, enabling uh, children and communities to connect through a couple of other uh, side initiatives as well, such as the Community uh, Network Hub. So we have invested about $165 million in upgrading school networks so that they can participate in broadband coverage. We've invested $211 million in network for learning to provide a fast, predictable and uncapped internet access to schools along with network security. Uh, we have, uh, in last year's budget, we uh, contributed another $2.5 million to the Computers and Homes program to help to ensure that children who are learning on digital technologies at school can still access uh, those technologies or similar uh, when they're at home. Uh, and the other thing I was going to mention, and this is just, just fate, as you might say, we announced a $5 million investment in Connected Learning Advisory, which is a, a program to help teachers understand how they can make use of digital technologies in their teaching. And that's Karen's program. So <laughs> it's, it's wonderful that we're sitting on a panel, and um, she will, I'll leave her to talk more about that, other than just to make the point that uh, it is important that we don't leave this simply in the hands of people to, here's this wonderful technology, you work out uh, how to make use of it. So that's a, a service that will obviously help to bridge a gap there. But I did say that it's mainly about the learners and educators, and it's really about devices as fundamental to education as the chalkboard used to be. It's about collaboration in, amongst classes, across schools and around the world. Uh, it's about knowledge and sharing and collaboration amongst teachers too, such as through the POND initiative as part of Network for Learning, a, 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 an environment for teachers to share uh, uh, ideas and experiences. And it's also about the internet as a library. It's an enormous content and information source. 
But hopefully the teachers will be helping the pupils or the children to do some discernment. Because I was browsing the internet the other day and I found again the quote from Abraham Lincoln that reminded me that 85% of the quotes you read on the internet are made up. So I'd just like to finish as the angry twi- uh, twi begins to go by saying, oh, we have a great future in front of us, and I'm sure the education system will deliver. Loving that Tui already. Thank you very much, Brett. Gareth, would you like to be our next speaker, please? Well, kia ora, nā mihi nui kia koutou. Kia ora. it's awesome to be here again, and thank you very much for having me back. I guess I want to kick off by telling about the time I was visiting Stephen Lethbridge and the crew out at Taupaki School out West Auckland. You know, here you've got kids playing with Arduinos, robotics, 3D printers. They're not just consuming digital content, they're literally creating it themselves. And it's incredibly inspirational stuff. It reminds me when I was at high school, you know, learning or only having the options of metalwork or woodwork and I know I look 16 and a a digital native but I remember you know missing out on those opportunities and starting out on the old Macintosh 128k and queuing up for computers at the libraries but now as a dad to two kids you know it's critically important that we as a country both for our social and economic future take up the digital opportunities. Is that the translation? Do I get extra time for translation (laughs) laughs? Yep, yep. (laughs) And I guess, you know, the important thing is there's been some pretty disturbing economic news out of China and Australia, you know, just today. And for a low-wage, low-value commodity producer like New Zealand, we need to be taking up this digital education opportunity to be moving to an internet-based economy. And, you know, what I've been saying for years is there's no limit to the amount of exports we can be sending across those cables. There is a limit, and we are seeing those limits in terms of dairy intensification in our waterways and on our environment. So we've got those fantastic examples of uh, great teachers, great principals, great schools, Taupaki, you know, Manukalini Project, And sitting on the digital education in the 21st century inquiry along with Claire and Nikki Kay, you know, it was quite shocking, to be frank, to hear that all this innovation was happening despite the ministry, not because of it. It was incredible that in 2012 we were still hearing that we weren't teaching teachers or trainee teachers digital education skills. So I do want to acknowledge the good work of the government in terms of the UFB, the SNAP, the Network for Learning. There has been a lot since then. But what we still hear from teachers is the lack of professional development, so this is where we need to be focusing. I think a big area we could see some further action is breaching that digital divide, because we are seeing a growing inequality in terms of accessing the digital environment, but also in terms of uh, accessing the future. Now what we see is one in four homes, or 340,000 homes, according to Stats NZ February this year, still don't have internet access. So I think this has to be a big priority as part of the education uh, projects being rolled out by the government. We see the Computers and Homes program, which is absolutely fantastic, but at only 1,500 a year, my office calculated it's going to take 227 years to finally get round all of them. We can't seconds. be waiting that long. So I guess, you know, my vision is to truly embrace digital education, cross that digital divide, you know, make internet access a right, provide that infrastructure, and I guess my commitment to you is to keep pushing it in Parliament and working across party lines to advance that, because it shouldn't be a political issue, you know, it's a national issue. I think that's nice, Tui, actually. Was it? No? Either way, oh, here it comes. <laughs> Claire, the floor is yours. How do I make this work? Is it working? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, 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 thanks. I haven't got much time, I have to talk fast. Um, uh, thanks, Gareth, because you've touched on things I want to say, so I'm not going to repeat them. My job is to try and today is to try and inject some real urgency into this discussion because, uh, in my view, in the Labour Party's view, this is really urgent and for really good reasons. Um, asked myself four questions in thinking about this subject. The first one was, how important is the internet in di- and di- digital literacy and education, all levels of education? Well, of course, the answer is if it's important. But you know, and we did. Uh, There was a select committee inquiry into 21st century learning in 2012. Gareth, I, uh, Nikki Hughes, uh, Nikki 
UK, and uh, Tracy Martin sat on that, and uh, a lot of good work was done identifying a whole lot of issues. You know, I'm not going to reel them off because I'll run out of time. 48 recommendations. Um, so the second question I asked is, so does our system, does our education system get the issues, and do they, um, are they moving fast enough? Well, I have to say back to you, absolutely, they kind of get it, but absolutely not the importance of moving really fast. In 2012, there was an, another report written looking at sort of where we'd got to and, that, and came up with 23 recommendations about how we weren't moving fast enough. Well, it's now 2015 and there's so many things um, still not being done uh, in, in that space. Um, and the, I guess the most, um, the, the third question I asked myself is, um, why is this so important? What is the urgency? Well, let me just uh, give you a couple of um, statistics. So an, an American report in 2013, um, and it's all about work. It's about the future of work for our kids. An American report in 2013 came up with a figure that 47% of US jobs are at risk in the next two decades. Um, just last month, um, the uh, Australians did a report, and their report said that 40%, um, 5 million Australian jobs are going to disappear in the next 10 to 15 years because of the impact of technology, which is essentially the impact of the internet right across our economy. Now, if that doesn't give you a sense of urgency, I don't know what does around our education system and whether or not it's equipping um, our kids to come out of school in, in ways that they're going to be able to um, do the seconds. jobs of the future, and whether our teachers are being resourced and uh, the professional development is such that they are able to be able to cope with the necessary changes in our system. Um, and so I came to my fourth question, and that's the question I want to put to you, um, is, is, is our education system in danger of being irrelevant? Fantastic. Thank you very much, Claire. Now, as I said, we have two educationalists joining us today. And so I'd like to invite Karen. Would you please share your perspective? Uh, kia ora, maloalele, te falava. Um, it's pretty cool to be a ringer in the parliamentary forum. Um, pretending to be important for an hour. It's wonderful. Um, I'd like to talk briefly from the perspective of someone who works with schools all the time um, and who is deeply involved in networks and communities um, right across the education sector from early childhood right through primary and secondary. Um, and you've already uh, referred to the Connected Learning Advisory, which is a, a new program that um, I have the, the privilege of, of leading and working with. I've got other colleagues in the room here. Um, and I think if we're thinking about supporting young people to participate and to um, prepare themselves for the kind of world that, that Claire is talking about, um, I think some of us might be forgiven for thinking um, that young people are already participating pretty well. There's been some exciting stories in the media, um, puffer jackets, English speeches on Facebook whipping various media sources into a frenzy. Um, but I think um, what we're really looking at here is how the education system can help prepare our young people um, to take their place as active citizens and increasingly as the kind of services that we would see as central to living our lives move online, we're talking about preparing young people to be able to access services, access knowledge and be contributors themselves. There are three key things that, that run through the, the various programs and plans that are available to help schools. And I'm not certainly saying that they're all, they're all perfect, and I think there are, there are areas where we could certainly um, be, be doing more. There are, if you think about the access and connection, and we've already alluded to um, N4L, the managed network, uh, the 2020 Trust and the great work they're doing with computers and homes. Uh, the ministry certainly funds software and hardware, um, laptops and so on for, for schools. Um, there's been a strong focus, I think, on the infrastructure to, um, to uh, 
provide um, technologies to schools. And actually what we're finding in the advisory, because we're working with schools every day, that actually that has taken away quite a lot of um, barriers for schools. Um, and it's making, making their role much easier. Where things are a real challenge, and I think it's been alluded to already, is growing that capability uh, in the education sector um, at the board of trustees level, leadership level, teacher level. There's already some hugely impressive work going al along in different schools around New Zealand. And I actually think we have got a curriculum that supports the kinds of learning that, that we would want for, for a modern um, education system. Um, and we've also got some really um, exciting opportunities in the curriculum in terms of designing learning that young people want to get involved in. Because if we're talking about participation, participation for what? Participation why? I mean, this is about finding meaningful opportunities so that young people want to get involved in the world that's going on around them. And I think that's a real challenge for us in education as well. Kia ora. Thank you very much. I think there was a slightly early angry Tui, but I'm glad it didn't get in the way. And finally, Nigel, would love to hear from you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so 26 years ago, when the University of Waikato brought the internet to New Zealand, um, this country was no longer um, geographically remote at the edge of the South Pacific. And so we're now connected um, to the world, able to access information, transact business, communicate, collaborate across the internet. So in 25 years, the internet has fundamentally changed how we operate and it's changed the outlooks we have and it's brought new potential for growth and for business and education. So there'll be few people who don't interact with or are affected by the internet um, in some way each day. There'll be very few businesses who don't conduct some of their business online. So giving us access to the internet was the first thing that education did for the country to gain benefit from the internet. And to some extent, that answers your, your original question, Andrew. But I think, I think for us, the context today for education is twofold. One is to uh, use the internet to do what we already do better. And one is to help people use the internet in, in better ways. And I think um, at the heart of that is developing digital literacies. So in 2010, the Horizon Report or what was properly called the Technology Report for New Zealand was published, and that stated that digital literacy is a key skill in every profession and every discipline. The New Zealand academics are not using compelling new technology for teaching and research, and that the internet gives us cause to re-examine our roles as educators and our relationship with information. So for me, the biggest thing that education can do in terms of the internet is to help people develop their skills operating in a world which is radically different from 25 years ago. So Waikato, we've been examining what a digital student looks like and the relevant attributes that a graduate needs in order to be successful in today's online world. So many of these are very contextual and they, vary, you know, they differ across disciplines. Access is a universal need, but the skills and practices vary. So the online practice of an engineer is different um, from the online practice of a geographer, for instance. So then for us, teaching staff um, need support to embed digital literacy in their curricula and they need to adapt and reimagine their teaching. And that's not a trivial task. So I'm going to come back to that. But since this is a parliamentary internet panel, um, I think there's a companion question to Andrew's, and that is, what should government do to support education in this endeavor? And I think it's, it's more than just uh, pushing money at us. That's always nice. Um, certainly more than taking it away. Um, so, for instance, I understand that RIANS, uh, which provides a research and education network seconds. for tertiary and crown research institutes, will lose um, its ministry funding in 2017. So that becomes a significant shortfall, which has to be picked up by institutions. Um, this morning, Cathy uh, Brown talked about economic and social benefit the internet brings. And so, <laughs> I think... <laughs> I think, I think that there are other things which the government can do, and I might come back to them, them later in discussion. Well, thank you, panellists. I think we've had an excellent start to this panel today, and I would like to throw it out to the floor here. A couple of themes are already emerging. 
and I'd like to paraphrase very, very heavily what those themes that I see here. From Brett, we heard about the substantial amount of good work that's already been done and a large amount of investment from central government. If I was to paraphrase Gareth, what I heard from Gareth today was a great story about the potential that is yet to be met and almost the risk aversion that we've got to start to think about diversifying our economy and really seizing some of these new opportunities that really enabling ICT education in our um, economy could bring. From Claire, I very much got her sense of urgency about how we can do this better and faster than how, how we're, <laughs> what we're doing now. And from Karen and from Nigel, we got those fantastic expert perspectives about what they see as the opportunities and challenges here. I'd like to throw this open to the floor now for questions from you people. We've got our mic runners at the ready. So please, what questions would you like to contribute about how we can really maximise the opportunities that we have from our education system to realise best the benefits that the internet could offer this country? Uh, there's reference to uh, the use of education to deal with the threat of technological automation. I was wondering if we really expect that education is going to be able to mitigate that threat. Uh, I don't think I don't think that's the 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 question that I was trying to answer. Or so probably no is the answer to that. Other than to say that it's got to be a uh, a way a way of equipping um, our young people coming through school and going through tertiary education to not only be equipped for the jobs of the future that are that uh, a, a, that are we don't know about now, um, but also to be equipped with the skills to be able to adapt and change to the environments that they're in much quicker and, and better than, than they're able to now. So it's the creative thinking, the anal, ana, uh, analytical thinking, it's uh, for the jobs that, that is predicted that you're going to have to change careers 10 times in your lifetime. Um, uh, and you know, in, in 15 years, that you know that you may not be. There's no point in getting a driver's license anymore because there are driverless cars or whatever the 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 changes that are that are up before us. That the kids that are going through school now. So it, I mean, th things as basic as teaching kids code. You know, that's pretty important, you know, right from a very early level. But there are so many other things that we need to be doing now that um, that are equipping the teachers to teach in ways that are different to equip the kids to be able to deal with the future. Thank you, Claire. Do you have a point yeah, that you'd I like mean, to add? Yeah, very quickly, uh, I think the answer is no, but we need to start preparing for that old cliche, which is preparing our kids for the jobs that haven't even been created yet. I mean, one tangible example of this is uh, additive manufacturing 3D printing. You know, this is something The Economist said is, could be as important as the coming of the factory was, yet when I wrote to the Ministry of Education to ask, well, how many schools have got them? They said, well, we don't know. And, you know, in my surveys, it's often the, the richer schools uh, that have them. Uh, likewise, with, with coding, we need to be giving kids access to, to play, experiment, familiarise, uh, and learn some of these new technologies coming through. So we've got to look to the future with confidence and with flexibility and agility. Karen, if I can extend this to you here, surely predicting some of these future trends has always been a challenge for education anyway. Is, is this anything different from what we're doing anyway? I think it is. I think, I think it's quite easy to say that we're preparing students for, with respect for jobs that don't exist yet. But I also think that that gives the impression that education is somehow um, trying to um, um, you know, think about students as, as a few ways off from engaging in the world around them. Um, I certainly don't think we're trying to educate students to, to offset some future automation, but I think it's, it's really important to think of our young people as they're citizens now, they're engaging in the world now. And so the focus is not on you know, a few years hence and, and what jobs they might have, but on creating an education system that is something engaging and meaningful and helping them develop critical literacies, sense of identity and self. Because it's those kind of critical approaches to the world around them, and that's been discussed in lots of sessions today, that's going to help young people be um, critical and active citizens. Thank you. Our next question. 
Um, there seems to be a lot of stuff from my world for kids and for teenagers, and you may not think there is, but when you're looking at it from middle-aged people who could easily work 30, 40 more years, there's very little, well, I, I've found very little for those people, and they are working now, and they need the skills now, and they are in the future now, and they used to interact with the government now, but I can't find anything that I think is really for those people who are already out there doing this stuff. So if you, do you know of anything, anything coming down the pipeline in that area? So, can I jump in? Um, can I say last weekend, um, and I'll just mention the Highlanders here, because the Highlanders won a game of rugby. Um, but I was in Wellington and I went to Gov Hack. Um, and hands up anyone who was at that, because it was really fantastic. Um, and I spent an hour and a half going around talking to the different groups. So one of those groups was preparing, was developing a, um, a, a mechanism called What's Next, um, which is a resource for kids to uh, going through school to know, to go and look and find what kind of careers, what kind of things they could do next. And they'd identified a gap that that didn't, ex you know, that there wasn't a resource like that or that there didn't seem to be anything like that that existed. And so I'm giving them a shout out because I hope that they take it to the next stage. Um, that kind of thing is really necessary. I've got two 15 year olds. Um, th you know, m I've got real fears about the career options that are being offered that don't necessarily match up with the careers that, you know, that they're, they're going to need to go into or want to go into or whatever. So um, when there's a lot of mismatching, uh, there's a lot of work to do. I'm not saying no work is being done. I think it is being done. But it's not happening fast enough. And, and this stuff is really urgent. Well, I think that there was an excellent um, question there. And I wonder whether... Brett or Nigel, you'd like to chime in there because, of course, education isn't just for our dear children. And when we think of lifelong learning here too, there's plenty of the rest of the economy and our society that can be educated too. Any thoughts, gentlemen? Yeah, certainly, I, I take the point because I think you, you're, it's a point very well made. We don't promote or we don't see promoted uh, particular uh, further education programs for, for people in, in, in their 30s or into their middle age. Uh, I do think there are opportunities there. The first element I'd make is, is obviously professional development opportunities within whatever job or industry the people might be in at the moment. Uh, uh, and of course, there are always the avenues to return, uh, if one wishes to, into the education system uh, to learn a completely, potentially completely new field. Uh, and then for those who are probably most likely uh, to, to feel the brunt at a, you know, a job level f through automation uh, and, and perhaps less skilled workers. There's an opportunity through training programs through our social services, uh, through WINS, to, to, if I look back at what happened in, say, the manufacturing industry through uh, continual automation, what you find is very unskilled labour can re retrain into more of a process management role. So there are steps. It's not a step from shop floor to company president, but there are still steps either within the industry or within some technical or trade training uh, if the job is, is disestablished. But I do think it's a, a point very well made. Nigel? Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that we see in terms of working with, uh, with staff and their development is that um, the workplace learning is actually really important. So it, it, gives, um, it gives you use of, of things uh, very... Um, you know, context to what it is you're doing. So rather than, you know, while we could run night school classes, things which sit outside, um, um, you know, the workplace, for me, I think, um, you know, in terms of what you, what you were asking, getting, um, getting businesses to think about how do they bring their workers on? What is the imperative for them to, to, to find this important? Because I think it is about, you know, our environment's changed and um, we need to adapt to that new environment. It is completely different from what it was 25 years ago. And uh, if, we, if we don't adapt, then in a way, you know, if you take an ecological perspective, we'll just wither. And, um, you know, the, the countries which will success, are successful are the ones who will, um, you know, adapt and, and, um, to, to the stuff which we don't know is there. 
But I think it is, you know, although there is that sort of sense of, you know, training people for jobs which, which don't exist, we actually have to get people to work um, in the environment which exists now. And if they're confident and capable in that, then that will place them well for whatever comes next. Some fantastic challenges there. Gareth, you want to join him? Yeah, well, I mean, it's something we've talked about is, you know, the digital inequality, the digital divide. But what we're seeing is sort of a forgotten generation, a, a generational digital inequality. I mean, my mum's going through it right now, and I can talk about it because I know my mum's not on Twitter and won't see it. But, you know, she was asking me the other night on the phone, how do I forward an email, which I'm sure everyone in this room takes for granted. But where does she go? You know, we don't have schools as hubs to be providing it. She's over 55, so she can't get a student loan. You know, many of her generation have already hit the seven-year uh, lifetime student loan limits. You know, we've seen cuts to adult student education. So actually, in the real world, uh, sorry to burst the, you know, cross-party love bubble we've got here, but um, we've actually seen some really detrimental cuts which have had a fundamental impact, you know, particularly for that generation. And, you know, if we're going to take preparing for the future and the coming economy seriously, we've actually got to put back in place those steps. So, you know, that's something I think is really important. And one quick last example is, you know, visiting recently the local Wellington soup kitchen, they don't get any support for it, but it's probably the single most effective thing they do. They run a, a little internet cafe with advice for their clients so they can do things like update a CV, which um, is having a real world difference, but they don't get any support for it. Gareth, I was amazed it took halfway through the session for that love bubble to burst. Um, Karen. Maybe just as a final comment on this question. And I think it's been interesting listening to the panel um, talk about, I guess, or even make generalisations about the needs of a particular group of people. And I think certainly one of the options is to look at the kinds of um, support and training and so on that might be available for people at different ages and generations. I also think there's an onus on people who design services for different um, groups and different members of the population. And I think the services um, who, who uh, design or increasingly putting their services online there's, there's certainly ways to review um, in terms of kind of user-centered design, design methodology to find out what the needs are. And so the onus isn't always on the user to upskill, that people designing services and putting them online think about the people that they're designing for and start with an inclusive mindset from the beginning. Fantastic. Thank you. We have a question down here. Hi there. I'm Joe Stockman from the Innovation Partnership. This is a potentially ideological question, so I'd like to ask the two educators on stage to actually answer it first, um, at least. The greatest examples of cool, interesting stuff done in the digital space and education that we've seen have been the trailblazers who have gone out in front of um, government and in front of the Ministry of Education. We're talking about Taupaki and, and Manaya Kalani. They haven't waited for government. They've gone out and done it themselves. So how much should government um, be involved and be setting criteria and how much should they be uh, standing back and providing opportunity and funding for schools to go out and do this stuff themselves? The, Off you go. So I, I, I think, I think the, um, part of the opportunity for government is to provide direction and to support um, development of strategies in, in that space. Certainly... Um, yeah, we see in the in the school sector that, that you know over the recent years the government has been putting a lot of effort and and you know um, Karen talked about the you know connected learning advisory and various other initiatives. Um, in in the tertiary sector, we're not we're not seeing that we're not seeing any any drivers for um, universities, polytechnics to actually um, pick themselves up and say hey, this is important for us. And so, you know, VCs, CEOs are going to spend their money on what they think is important. So um, I, I get sort of caught between two, you know, I, I, I find it difficult to work out whether we should allow government to actually drive entirely what we do, because I know that won't go down well um, but back home. But I think, <laughs> I think it is important that there is um, some direction given. And, uh, and as Claire said earlier, some urgency given to, to this. Karen, would you like to take it on? 
I think it's most effective when, um, at a policy or government level, we see the same behaviours being modelled that we want our schools to have. So collaborative and connected um, government listening to the needs of the community and providing the support and the resources and the leadership, but not mandating exactly how it should happen. Um, there's certainly a need, I think, for some joined up thinking across um, different areas of government that provide different resources to the, the schooling sector. And to do that, government needs to understand exactly what the needs of the education sector are. There has been recent funding under um, the Investing in Educational Success Initiative to try and support innovation at school levels. And I know that got announced this week. There's been um, about 60, 70 schools um, and teachers have received funding for innovation. So there is a fostering of it. But I don't think that the government can, can mandate innovation. They can create space and resourcing and then get out of the way and let some of the amazing um, teachers uh, see what they can do in order to um, meet the needs of their students. Um, certainly being able to support schools to network and connect with each other so those stories come to the surface and other schools can learn from each other is, uh, is a powerful um, What do you reckon, Claire? Do you reckon government needs to get out of the way here? And if so, how? Okay, so look, the innovation people, the early adopters, the innovators are so necessary, absolutely necessary. And you know what? You know, a lot of you are in this room right now. What worries me is that how many years ago, five years ago, whatever, when NetHui number one was held, that those innovators were sort of stood out as beacons of where we needed to go. And you, you're still standing out as beacons. And the integration of that hasn't happened um, enough yet. So absolutely government has to be involved because government is uh, looks at the bigger picture and looks at the gaps and was well, supposed to look at the gaps and supposed to act on, on what the big policy issues are. And just to put that in context, you know, the pace of change that is happening with technology is having such an impact in, in, in terms of the um, pro power of computer processing, um, mass connectivity, um, uh, the globalisation of supply change, the the um, the ageing population that is um, that that is growing is, is a bigger sector that is that is wanting or needing to work longer in their life and what the implications are of that. Plus, we have growing youth unemployment. Those are really big policy issues that government needs to look at in terms of the big picture and see uh, where it needs to intervene. And, you know, I'm coming back again to the fact that, we're, you know, the urgency is not there. And not only that, that there, we cannot expect the market to somehow fill those gaps. One of the first things that the national government did when it was elected was to uh, axe adult community education. Now, that second chance learning, that, that was part of the glue that enabled um, people who were trying to get back into the workforce or trying to move into another area uh, to actually do that in a way that was affordable and, and accessible. Well, getting rid of things like that is not actually going to help. We have to have more of those sorts of things. We've got to retrain people. We've got to enable retraining and, and make it a right to be retrained. So that um, so that's where government needs to really be interventionist and visionary and, and actually pull its finger out. Well, there's been a bit of a gauntlet thrown there, Brett. Do you want to try it on? Yes, thank you, Andrew. It is on. So, uh, firstly, I'd like to endorse what Karen said about you can't legislate or mandate innovation. The government's job is to provide some enablement, provide some support, and let the innovators do what they do best. I've had the good fortune to visit a few places, schools around the country, seen this sort of innovation in action, particularly in modern, le modern learning environment schools. Uh, recently, I visited Mind Lab in Petoni, another one that's teaching technology and making technology exciting for young children. And just to segue, Slightly, I met at the University of Waikato a couple of months ago, and a couple of the heads there were, or deans there, were saying that if we talk about science, technology, mathematics, if we want to encourage uh, children to, to study in those areas, it's about getting involved really young and making it exciting. And that's what I see. I've seen this in modern learning environments, I see it in the likes of Mind Lab. So the government's job is to support, and then as Karen said, get out of the way and let those people do what they do well. But I think there is a role for the government to be an exemplar. 
to be digitally connected and use digi uh, digital channels to, to use technology in what we do and the services we deliver, both in terms of public, better public services results 9 and 10, but basically within the systems of government. Uh, what, what we used to call in, in places like uh, IBM and, and that that I've worked in in the past, eating your own dog food. And that's what government should be doing. I just want to finish up by taking issue with a comment Claire made about the adult community education uh, budget cuts. The, bu the government did not slash ACE. What we did was repurpose it onto literacy, numeracy, and English as a second language. Those skills that will help particularly new migrants adapt and integrate into, into New Zealand and participate fully, and also to help people actually yeah, develop the skills to help their employment prospects. Can I just say, go, uh, it's a, thanks for the question, Joe, but I may have misheard it as sort of an either-or, because obviously it's, it's not, you know. Government's job is to set the leadership, the urgency, the direction, resource it, and uh, make sure those barriers are removed. So, you know, one quick example in, in the inquiry we heard is that copyright is holding back teachers from sharing material with other teachers so kids can get... Uh, access to the best quality teaching materials. And what we've seen is this much already delayed copyright review already delayed again. So there's a, a practical example we could see uh, to help teachers share and collaborate so government's breaking down those barriers. I'll take one more question. Where is it? To you please, sir. Uh, yeah, so my name's Chuan Jing Lee. I, my question is about the New Zealand curriculum. Um, if you could redesign or, or add to or subtract from the primary and secondary school curriculum to support the role that you think the internet will play in our future society or economy. Um, in the most concrete terms that, that you feel comfortable saying, what would you do? Can I invite Karen to start off here? <laughs> well, first of all, I have to say, I, I think when the curriculum was developed, We've created a world-leading curriculum already, and that's been noted across many jurisdictions around the world. Um, I know there have been reviews and there's discussions underway about the way um, digital technologies are featured in the curriculum, uh, and there are certainly initiatives at the moment to look at how um, there can be clearer direction around um, supporting students around coding and robotics and, and so on. And so those conversations are actively underway at the moment. Um, the schools that are being innovative, and I'm not just talking about the ones that are innovative with buildings and 3D printers, but innovative in the way that they're designing learning, can already take the existing curriculum and do something world-leaning that will help students um, respond to the world in which we are living in today. You know, they look for connections across learning areas. They take the, there's lots of key competencies at the start of our curriculum that talk about relating to others and being able to navigate um, text and, and, and literature and the kind of things that you might see online. It's already pretty much there. And so I'd like to um, advocate for, for the fact that we've actually got a, a great foundational model for schools to design exciting learning. The permission is there um, and, and acknowledge the fact that that where there are opportunities to refine it, um, they're being taken now. Nigel, your perspective. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with, with Karen. I'm a bit less qualified to talk about uh, primary um, level. But I think that, um, the, for, from my perspective, saying, OK, we're going to add this thing in to the curriculum, which is going to be about um, using digital tools is not the right approach. Our, it's our environment which happens to be infused with technology now and we need to just find ways to um, to use that environment to the best of our abilities to, to get the outcomes that we want. So, um, again, like Karen, you know, we, we should be, you know, t teaching the things which we, which we want to teach but we should be informing them with technology. And certainly that's, you know, that's one of the things that we're trying to push um, in, in Waikato. And you know, I think lots of other universities are. It's not, it's not about how do you do this technology stuff over there. It's how do you just adapt to the environment that we've got and, and make it do the stuff which we need. And one of the things it does do is it allows you to, um, I think it makes it much easier to change the way you teach to allow your teaching to become much more um, active, much more participative, um, rather than it being a very sort of transmissive approach where you, know, you end up with somebody here 
stood at the front telling you what it is you need to know? To our politicians, Brett. Uh, thank you. Um, so the first point I'd make around the curriculum is, is I really think that should be a decision for the educators, for the teachers. Uh, I'd fully endorse what Karen said. I don't think that politicians should be getting their hands dirty on how we might change the curriculum around the internet as such. But what I would say is if I had the opportunity is I would uh, make a very close assessment of how well or how optimised our spend around professional development areas are. I'm sure the $5 million that Karen's administering is being very well used, but the Ministry also spends about $8.5 million a year on professional development, specifically around using digital technologies in, in teaching. So I would want to have a good look to make sure that we're, getting the, we're using that in the right areas. I think it's about using technology to teach better and create better learning or, or broader learning. It's not about teaching technology for technology's sake. Gareth? I don't know if it's so much the curriculum or more the discussions around core subjects, because I'm really open to having a public conversation. Should we have digital literacy or digital studies or coding as core subjects? And this is something the UK House of Lords Select Committee has advised in a recent report. So I think we have to have that conversation openly, and in a way that's part of the internet principles uh, going out again. But I would say definitely when it comes to our trainee teachers, we need to make sure, you know, from next year, teachers who are going to become future teachers are given the skills because too often you know they look at the kids and say they're digital natives they can teach me that's not the way we should go about it and to you Claire yeah well I agree with uh, what Gareth said around the curriculum is I mean we we've got a world-class curriculum and it's a fantastic curriculum but is it um, is it you know as modern as it could be and the, the urgency word, which I've used a number of times today, is you know, why aren't we looking at whether or not the core subjects are what they need to be? Um, so digital technology is certainly an, an area for discussion there. Um, in terms of professional development, well, I, I think you used the word, the $8 million was the quantum. I don't think that's enough for, digital, for, for professional development. Um, just to put that in context, we're spending $26 million or whatever it is on discussion about whether or not we're going to have a new flag. And and we're and, and $8 million for professional development for our teachers, I'm sorry, that doesn't wash. Um, and I think that, that that is one of the big areas and it's what we're, how we're teaching the teachers. Um, those are the things that we need to address and we need to address them really soon. Well, with that in mind, I'm not going to take another question, I'm afraid, because I have promised these fine people and you fine people that we'll wrap this up as close to five as possible. Did you hear that subtle expectation reset? Um, so I'm going to ask the final question here, and this will be our wrap-up question, and I'm going to give you fine panellists two minutes each. So whatever points you'd like to make, but my final question to you educators, and I'd like to start with you here, Karen, what is the one thing that you'd like to see change here off the back of a conversation like this? God, no pressure. Um, there are many things that I would like to change. But <laughs> Sorry. No, I'll answer, I'll answer the question. Um, what I've been hearing in the different sessions that I've been at today um, and listening to the discussion this afternoon is that there is a need for um, cross-party but also cross-industry, education, um, commercial sector to be able to take part in a shared discussion around the kind of vision that we want for education, which includes things like teacher training, includes the kind of um, uh, support that we're providing to um, uh, upskill teachers and help them understand how they can adapt the curriculum for the environment in which we're learning. I think at the moment, the conversations, the new initiatives, the investments are quite disjointed. And so if I could wave a magic wand, it would be in favour of um, a much greater joined up conversation. It's very easy to kind of wave my hand and say that. You didn't say I could say something that would be easy to do. Um, but I think there are, there are lots of great initiatives. There is a great appetite, I think, for the kind of urgency that Claire has been talking about. But at the moment, many of those initiatives and programs that are in place are not 
connected in a clear vision for what we want for both our young learners and also learners that are coming out of the school sector and then continuing um, in, in the workplace. And so that would be the thing that I'd be looking for, be a coherent, clear vision with the government in partnership with the education sector. That, fantastic. Thank you. Nigel, to you. Same question. Same question. Possibly the same answer, really. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think the um, you know what what I see in the in the tertiary sector is this lack of of strategy, is this lack of urgency, uh, lack of reason uh, the the institutions find to, um, or as a sector to say what is it that we're doing here in terms of of our you know um, developing digital literacies within um, our workforce, within our students, and how does that look across the across the country? So. You know, taking it back um, in terms of, of um, you know, Parliament and, and, and that sort of governance of the country, you know, having that vision for what it is that we want the country to, to look like, how we want to use the internet to the best of our abilities, and then coming up with, um, with you know, with strategies to, to say, and initiatives to say, this is, this is the steps that we're going to take. We're not going to change it all tomorrow. Um, but, you know, it is a case of, of, you know, we have to do something. We have to make sure it's not just, well, we're doing something because we have to do something. There is a rationale for that. Um, but, you know, it's, there isn't a conversation happening um, across, across the sectors, across the education sectors and across um, education and business. I don't think there's a real conversation happening that will, will really make a difference at the moment. Again, a fantastic challenge. I'm going to change the question up slightly for the final two minutes for our three politicians here. And that question is for you guys. You've heard this conversation. You've participated. You've clearly got policies and ideas of your own. I'd like you to tell this audience here, what, what's the one big thing that you want to take back to your parties as change here off the back of a conversation like this today? Would you like to start here, Brian? Well, thank you, Andrew. So what I'd take back as the, as the main thing actually is, is around collaboration and actually making sure that we don't build islands of innovation around our school system and so we get places like the Manaya Kalani cluster we get modern learning environments and teachers coming up with innovative ideas we've got places like Mind Lab teaching really interesting exciting things what we have to make sure is that all of that knowledge and that practice those ideas are effectively shared so that those that want to take them up can take them up. And I talked before about the POND collaborative system with a network for learning, that's one thing. But what I would take away and advocate for is that we you know, place some oversight around making sure that, that this sort of innovation can be to the benefit of all across our system, not just isolated islands and clusters. Fantastic stuff, and I love it that the angry Tui hasn't had to come out once yet. Will he come out for you, Gareth? Well, I think my answer is we need to reinflate that cross-party love bubble. Because <laughs> what I've very much heard, and you remember this Parliamentary Internet Forum formed at Annette Hui many, many years ago. What I hear very clearly from you is you want to see politics taken out of it. You want to see us working together, and innovation and looking to the future shouldn't be a political football. Uh, however, unfortunately, it, it is, and let's work to, to put that aside. You know, in fact, the economy has become more simplified over recent years than less. So, I guess my message that I hear very clearly is: let's work together. Let's focus on innovation. Let's get in the top half instead of the bottom half of the OECD for R and D. You know, let's really embrace digital ed education. Let's set some clear targets when we're going to get 100% internet access for everyone who wants it. You know, let's set a target of five years and let's achieve it, and not just um, you know spend a little bit of money. Let's, uh, in terms of what we heard this morning with ISOC. You know, we may have some of the best broadband in the world, but could we honestly, hand on heart, say that we've got some of the best uses or processes for education when it comes to looking around the world? So let's be able to answer that. You know, let's see our schools as school hubs. Let's make sure we've got the infrastructure, the leadership, uh, the market uh, support, and capital raising for an IT sector. But I guess ultimately, let's just work together because a, a smarter, more innovative economy is in everyone's interests. Fantastic stuff. And Claire? Thank you. Just, just going back to the cross-party love bubble, um, just so that you know that it does exist to some degree, that um, Brett, Gareth and I all sit on the Commerce Select Committee and every week we take turns to take baking along. And, and can I just say, 
Brett is probably the best home baker that I've come across. So that's a good thing. Now my time starts. Um, <laughs> so look, um, Labor's undertaking is undertaking a really big piece of work, and it's called the Future of Work Commission. And it's a two-year piece of work, and we're looking at five different streams. Um, we're trying to involve as many people in the community, organisations, interested stakeholders, people who want to have a say about this because it's so important. Those two um, statistics I reeled off about the jobs that are at risk, we don't have that information for New Zealand. We need to have it. But we're looking at the impact of technology on work. I'm leading that stream. Um, we're looking at uh, security of work. And what are the implications? We're looking at impact on Māori and Pacific populations. We're looking at economic development and sustainability uh, opportunities. And we're looking at education, 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 which runs through everything. Because if we're going to have a workforce that's able to be flexible and adaptable and yet have some security and have the skills for the future, we have to be looking at our education system right now and, and be rethinking um, a lot of the things that we've done for a long time. Um, it's not our curriculum that's the issue, it's the way that, that our system is so clunky, our too many silos, um, the need to have more cross-party discussion, the need to take it out to the community and turn it into a piece of work that everybody has some buy-in into and that has really big policy implications. We, please, if you're interested, contact me. We need to have your input into this. This is a really big conversation, the future of work. Oh, I've got to wait for the toy. Um, Everybody, thank you from me, actually, for um, having the opportunity to share the stage with these wonderful people on what I find to be a personally fascinating topic. I've had a lot of fun giving you this parliamentary internet forum tonight, um, but please do join me in thanking our panellists. Thank you. Thank you.